The Unshackled Waves, episode 250. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, welcome to another Waves episode in this new regular time of 7pm Wednesday nights. This week it's been culture war issues that have dominated the news cycle. Former rugby player Israel Folau last Friday opened a GoFundMe page to fund his legal challenge against Rugby Australia's termination of his playing contract for his Sinners Instagram post. This has attracted a fair bit of controversy given that he has a property portfolio worth $7 million. On Monday morning, GoFundMe pulled Flowers page for violating their terms of service. The escalation of emotion around this issue has increased with freedom of speech, freedom of religion and freedom of association being hotly debated. Corey Bernardi announced last week he was planning to deregister his Australian Conservatives Party after their poor performance at the federal election. He claims the party is no longer needed because Scott Morrison is a good Christian Conservative Prime Minister. A lot of his uh, former members and supporters would beg to differ with that view and are now vowing to relaunch a proper Conservative Party very soon that, to offer a real alternative to the Australian voters. To discuss all this, as well as to give us a report on their True Blue Crew Aussie Pride Solidarity March in Sydney last Saturday, is once again Senior Editor of The Unshackled, Damien Ferry. Damien, welcome back to another show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Uh, now, we've decided to premiere this rather than do a live episode so we can be on uh, a bit earlier uh, so that uh, more people can see us uh, earlier in the, the evening. Yeah, good idea. Because I know that you can't uh, get on until quite late uh, these days to, to record these. Yeah, it's, it's a bit like that when you've got a handful of kids and um, you just, uh, the only space of time you have is sometimes late in the evening. So we, we do what we can with what we've got. Yep, too right. Well, we'll, we'll comment on the, the news uh, as it's known when we're recording. Probably the biggest uh, news story of the week has been uh, Israel Folau's uh, legal fighting fund uh, to uh, contest uh, Rugby Australia's termination of his $4 million uh, playing contract over his Sinner's Instagram post. Now, last Friday, he opened up a GoFundMe asking for $3 million to, to fund his uh, lawsuit with the, the Fair Work Commission for religious uh, discrimination. Now, there was a lot of criticism of him doing this at the time, given... Well, the newspapers then reported that he had a, a property portfolio worth uh, $7 million, and so everyone was saying, well, it's a bit rich of you to, you know, beg for money uh, when, you know, you could probably uh, fund it uh, yourself. So there was already a lot of a public, uh, a, a, I wouldn't say public backlash, but I'd say a lot of media backlash, like even the Daily Telegraph and the Herald Sun were, were having a go at him. So there was already a, a hostile environment to him. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I'm actually quite sick of, of seeing these endless articles every day pop up on my news feed because it's been out of control. And um, the amount of um, attacks that I've seen on him is quite disgusting. Um, now, it, it seems to me that they are, the, the mainstream media is really using this case um, definitely um, as a form of attack to be able to promote their own agendas and to definitely um, show where they stand when it comes to these type of issues, to really promote their SJW sort of causes and basically make out the, uh, the LGBT community to be um, an endangered uh, species, so to speak. Now, in regards to this, a lot of people that I have seen comment on this story basically say well you know what he actually broke the contract the terms and conditions so too bad but this is the problem why is it that we have terms and conditions in a contract that actually allows a boss to dictate what a worker can do or say in their own personal time i mean this is something that normally left wingers should be in agreement with me on i mean how dare a boss be able to have that control over a worker. I mean, that's insane. It's like enslavement. I mean, when you are in the workplace, 
fair enough if you need to toe the line, but if you're outside of work and you're on your own social media account in your own spare time, why is it that you cannot say a certain thing because it is in disagreement with the person that owns that particular business? I just don't understand how something like that in this day and age can be a possibility. Um, not only when it comes to the boss in itself, but if the shoe was on the other foot and Rugby Australia was a conservative organisation and um, the person in charge of that organisation had conservative beliefs and there was somebody, for instance, that uh, done the, the, the exact opposite thing and was promoting LGBT material on social media. Now, if that organisation did the same thing and say, sorry, but we're firing you because you're not adhering to our code of conduct, I think that that would be an absolute outcry and there is no way that that organisation would have been able to get away with that. So why is it all of a sudden that it is okay um, if it was the other way around. Uh, it, it just, you can't have these double standards. Either you have this um, ongoing um, freedom of association or you don't. And we keep on seeing this agenda in which it seems to be that it works for one but doesn't work for the other. Uh, also with GoFundMe, um, it, must, it must be a, a new thing now, but I always, uh, always thought that GoFundMe was basically um, available to anybody. But it seems to me that also they, this website um, had a, um, a hidden clause or term and condition as they have put out recently. And uh, it states that, yeah, okay, you can pretty much use our services and say whatever you like as long as it doesn't criticise the LGBT community. Um, so again, you know, this is another way of uh, people with conservative ideology not really having a place to go. And um, it, it's just a real shame, really. Yeah, I pretty much realized that, you know, when people were uh, drawing attention to GoFundMe uh, facilitating this uh, fundraising that they were probably going to uh, pull the plug and lo and behold on Monday morning they announced that uh, they had removed uh, Falau's uh, GoFundMe because it violated their terms of service uh, because they, they wanted to be a uh, inclusive and uh, diverse uh, fundraising uh, platform. Uh, but uh, this is the, the same uh, platform that uh, allowed uh, Sarah Hansen Young to uh, crowdfund her defamation case against uh, David Linehelm for uh, uh, allegedly saying that uh, Sarah Hansen Young said all men are rapists. And uh, we also had Egg Boy who was able to raise $100,000 for his legal defense for uh, egging, or should I say assaulting a sitting uh, senator. Uh, and it was, uh, if I recall, the uh, the GoFundMe was set up for his legal defense and to buy more eggs, basically encouraging to, him to egg uh, more uh, politicians. And so those were, were both allowed, yeah, yet now sort of GoFundMe's uh, now taking a, a more active uh, discriminatory policy in who's allowed on the platform. That's exactly right, and it's disgusting. And I've actually seen a lot of people even comment when I've actually raised that case with them about Egg Boy raising, I think it was about 70000 or so. 100000 100000 was it? Well, there we go. Um, for violently attacking a politician and getting support that way. Even had politicians um, on the opposing um, uh, side of Fraser Anning actually promoting this. Um, it was quite disgusting. And also Sarah Hansen Young, like you mentioned, I think from memory it was about 60000 or so that she raised for her legal fees. And that was after she called all men pigs and, and um, also unleashed a lot of other uh, um, discrimina uh, discrimin discrimination against uh, um, old white men and uh, people that she um, you know, felt like she could discriminate against. Um, but the problem is here, when people were answering these, um, these things or replying to me when I put this to them, they basically said, well, Sarah Hansen Young was in the right because... Lionhelm was an evil pig or something like that along those lines. So they couldn't even really um, uh, like give a, a proper answer to me. All they could say is, well, she was in the right because I agree with her, you know. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is how stupid people are, really. They just don't see how uh, the, the, the hypocrisy applies. 
and, and they're more than happy to use it because it suits their agenda, of course. Another thing that I've um, found that people have complained about is the fact that, that he's um, got a lot of money and that he shouldn't have used the platform because of that. And I would reply in that, well, he's got $7 million in property portfolio, but how much of that money has he actually got in cash? So even though he's got money in assets, doesn't mean that he's got money um, in the bank that he could then fund a legal case. I mean, how many people out there, if they were in caught up in a situation um, as him, would actually sell their place just so they could bring a, um, a case to trial? Another reason I would actually give is that even though he's got money, it's not the factor um, of money in the first place as to why he's doing this. I mean, he could definitely afford it, but the reason why he's doing this is to make a point He's trying to make a statement and give publicity uh, to this very issue of religious freedom. And why not? I mean, he's actually showing and highlighting that Christianity and Christians in general on a large scale are perhaps some of the most oppressed people in our society, uh, just based on the attacks that he has got. And I think it's great that he's going to be able to raise this money because what he is basically showing is look, people, I've got this amount of support in the community backing me and backing people with my views. And that's what he's trying to get across here. It's not simply because he's trying to scab money off people. It's simply because he's trying to make a statement that there's many, many people that feel the same as he does in the community and watch out or whatever um, to politicians and to people in public that think otherwise that want to continue uh, this backlash and to continue to undermine freedoms. Um, another thing that I've heard people say and complain about, and actually uh, on one local paper of mine, I had a, um, had a local woman with a, with a kid that had cancer and she made the argument of, well, why is it that this person should be allowed to, to have a, um, a page on GoFundMe when my kid is suffering? And in response to that, I simply say this, there's millions and millions of people most likely on GoFundMe that have um, sickness and illnesses and conditions, and people are free to donate whenever they want and how much they want to those causes. And the fact is, why is it that perhaps he's getting a lot more money than your kid on cancer? And the reason is because your kid that has cancer is one of many people that have cancer, and who does it directly affect? It affects that child, it affects that particular family. But when it comes to Israel Folau's case, it actually affects everybody. When you attack freedoms, you attack everybody's freedoms, and that's why everybody can relate to this case rather than a case of somebody that perhaps has cancer. That's a big difference there, and why Israel now has managed to get so much more funding than other people. Like I said, I wasn't surprised that GoFundMe did this. In fact, I was shocked that other conservatives and libertarians were shocked that uh, big tech would uh, deplatform uh, somebody with unpopular views. I mean, they've been doing this for the past three years. I mean, we were just talking last week that uh, Blair Cottrell, his uh, bank account was closed by Westpac, yet that wasn't reported in the, the, the mm. mainstream media. There wasn't outrage about that, all oh, because, you know, he's a racist, fascist Nazi. Well, yeah, they're going like, to start, start with people who they deem extreme like there's been people who've been kicked off patreon paypal uh stripe all the the payment processes like of course they were going to come for uh, people like falau next they weren't going to stop it you know extremists yeah i mean they're definitely using this case as a scapegoat and they're basically saying to people um that would be deemed extreme watch out look at the kind of backlash and i mean i see a lot of people that um have uh, conservative views that they're scared i mean they're seeing what for hours copying and when you look up a, a particular news article for instance and you say um, I only have a half a dozen comments out of hundreds that are in support and you have literally hundreds attacking him it kind of makes you feel like well whereabouts um, am I in this uh, community uh, what kind of rights do I have and um, how am I considered uh, serious when so many people seem to be against me and I seem to be uh, largely a minority? And that's why they're, what they're trying to do here. Um, they're trying to uh, make Falau um, puni be punished, not only to punish him, but to warn people with his views to back off and not uh, go down his, um, um, his path, so to speak, and, and be loud and be vocal and remain silent. 
And when people do that, obviously then they're able to push whatever agenda they like. It's, um, it's very scary that this sort of thing is happening. Um, but I think what it does at least say is that he has a lot of support out there. And I think that's really important. When it comes to bank accounts, like you mentioned, I mean, they think that they're doing um, the community a favour by torturing these people with this kind of ideology. But what they're doing really is they're actually going to, in the end, cause people to go underground and to, you know, be more, you know, um, gather. And it's just going to be like the old days. It's going to be people going underground. Um, you know, they're going to build their own banks. They're going to build their own currencies eventually. They're going to build their own, you know, they're going to be self-sufficient. They're not going to rely on um, consumerism and, and, you know, and services like um, people are relying on now. So they think they might be doing um, a favour, but in the end, they're going to, you know, really cause a lot of harm. And it's only going to push people more away and more to the fringe because they're seeing how even mainstream people are getting so shafted now. I mean, it's not even really to do with ultra extremists anymore. Anyone to the right of the centre is, is basically seen as an extremist. So, I mean, really, who isn't an extremist these days? It's, it's quite scary. A lot has been talked about about the the power of I mentioned big tech, but just corporates in general. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Samet from the Center for Independent Studies, he's written a book on corporate virtue signaling, and he did an event with uh, Dave Pello a couple of weeks ago about did Qantas have Israel for last sacked because the CEO of uh, Qantas is uh, Alan Joyce. He gave a million dollars to the the yes to same sex marriage campaign, used uh, the the Qantas brand to promote same-sex marriage along with other social justice causes he's rejected that they had any part to play but he was in communication with rugby australia uh you know that they were going to terminate uh his contract so rugby australia sort of thought that it was good to to keep him happy but what we've also seen uh tonight is that uh israel Falau's wife uh, maria she's a professional uh netballer uh with a contract with netball australia and uh, a netball uh great uh, liz ellis has said oh you know rugby is, uh, sorry netball australia should uh sanction her for supporting her husband and then ANZ uh, Bank, who's one of the sponsors of Netball Australia, have come up with a statement condemning her for supporting her husband. And I think that's going way too far. I mean, what do you expect her to do? Like, she's, of course, she's going to support her husband. Well, you'd hope so. I mean, really, yeah. what do you expect? Like you, you mentioned there before, I mean, um, I mean, what, what would, would they really expect her to come out and, and take a, a separate position? I mean, it would be ludicrous for that to happen. Mm. Um, so it, it's just, it's really crazy that they're even going after his wife now. I mean, it's, it's, it just seems to me that these days um, the left are very, very united and they pounce at any particular story that come and they can see that, they're, um, that they can gain traction on. They really are strategic. They're very smart and they pounce on it and they do a lot of damage, you know. I mean, a lot of people wonder why they um, are, are gaining ground and, and doing really well, even though they didn't do well in the election. They're still, you know, getting people out there, protesting their causes. Um, so they they definitely got support out there and that's because they're able to uh, unite and they're able to... Um, just watch what's happening in the community and as soon as something um, that they disagree with comes up all of them just at once bang and they just pounce they they write letters of disgust they, they you know they write to go fund me's and other websites complaining take it down take it down i mean you know the amount of um of stories or pages so to speak i've seen on gofundme which are ludicrous i mean i've seen ones on there that you know people that um perhaps um are asking for sex changes for instance and they want people to fund that they want um you know people to fund all sort of you know um um damages and and you know it's just crazy really like i mean and yet you don't get conservatives writing to gofundme telling them to take the page down that's the the difference there you oh, know okay. the, gofundme the wouldn't take them down <laughs> No, no, of course not. But, I mean, at least, I mean, what you're seeing is that you're seeing the tolerance only on one side here. And, I mean, in many respects, as much as 
the right is being principled in um, when it comes to free speech. At the same time, it's, it, that's why they're losing as well, because even though they're accepting um, and, you know, saying the left is OK to say what they like and do what they like, they're not doing it for us at the same time. So it makes it really difficult because only one is tolerant and one isn't. So, um, but yeah, like you said, where are you going to go with it? It really, it really makes it difficult. Well, the reason why all of these uh, corporations and activists are running rampant is because they've basically got the stamp of approval of the, the federal government. You know, Scott Morrison, the alleged Christian conservative, when he was asked about this on Monday, said, well, this issue has already got uh, enough oxygen already, basically saying, I ain't touching that one. And mm. you know, the, he, he spoke before the election about wanting to introduce a religious discrimination act. I haven't heard... There was not a word about it during the election. There hasn't been a word about it afterwards. It seems to be dead, buried, and cremated. Uh, Scott Morrison, he just wants to steer clear of these uh, culture war issues. Yeah, that's right. And, I mean, ScoMo has to understand that if he actually ran on these culture war issues, he'd actually get more support than what he already has. I mean, it's very, very popular in the community. And like I've mentioned before in other podcasts, Whenever you have a, uh, a, a candidate or leader that is seen as a very traditional sort of social conservative leader, although they get attacked endlessly in the media, they perform very, very well at elections. I mean, you could only see uh, Abbott's landslide victory and John Howard's multiple victories. I mean, you know, every really social conservative leader always performed well, but then when you had a small L liberal in charge, they just scraped over the line or they lost. So, I mean, the media like to push the fact that, oh, they need a centrist leader, they need someone on the centre, but they don't win elections on the centre. I mean, it's a fallacy. I mean, it might be said for the Labor Party that they need a centrist candidate, but for the Liberals, they actually perform better on the right. And it always has been that way. So... I don't understand why Scott Morrison isn't running on this issue and really being a, um, uh, somebody that uh, can, can promote this and, and really get involved. I mean, he's obviously worried about the backlash, but then again, the people that most likely are against Falao wouldn't be ones that would vote for ScoMo anyway. So I don't see where he can lose there. I really think that at, at the very least, people can have respect for him and say, well, he is the, the Christian conservative candidate we thought he was. But it seems to me that people are really looking at him twice and thinking, well, is it all an act? Because he's not really showing himself to be that. Well, he probably thinks that because he won the election not campaigning on these culture war issues, that he probably thinks that's the way to roll, that I just need to campaign on, you know, lower taxes and economic management. That's why people voted for me. And he's he's sort of not like Turnbull, who's, you know, being being threatened by the, the conservative side in his party because, well, Morrison was the, the compromise candidate. He, he won the election, increased the majority over uh, over what Turnbull got in 2016. And so he just wants to avoid like getting pilloried in the media. And he's basically daring the like the conservatives who do care about this issue in his party, people like uh, uh, Erica Betts saying, well, what are you going to do? You're going to sack and replace me? Like, good luck with that. Like, mm -hmm. that's basically mm -hmm. his view. Yeah, I mean, look, I don't blame him for taking that sort of view because he's in a position where he wants to retain power and he, and he really wants to play things but I just don't think that's right and I don't think it's going to, in the long term, be beneficial to the country. I mean, regardless of retaining power, you have to do what is right endlessly. And I mean, if he's a Christian conservative, he obviously, or you would think he would have a social conservative sort of agenda, at least in the back of his mind. And he, if that's the case, he has to, you know, eventually run on that. I mean, he can't just keep it um, hidden and then when... It's, it's time that he wants to do it, it's too late, and then he can't end up doing it anymore. So, um, you know, it's just, just a matter of fact that he has to really stand up for what people uh, think he should be doing and, and representing the, the community at large here. Um, the thing is also, when it comes to economics, like you mentioned, that's a fallacy that the Liberals think that they only won based on economics and the tax cuts and, and the... Um, and it cuts the negative gearing and all of that sort of thing. That, that's a lie. Um, I can actually say that more than anything, that social issues are very important. And even though it wasn't a focus, at least um, the Liberals didn't focus on it during the election, 
there was a lot of people that voted Liberal because they absolutely detest the climate change agenda, absolutely hate it. Um, and that's something Labor Party haven't learned and continue to want to push, even though they they clearly lost, especially when it came to um, how Queensland and many other seats, Tasmania and so forth, rebelled against them. And not only that, but a, a lot of people really were disgusted by Labor Party's abortion policy, which was to make it um, public abortions for free in hospitals, in public hospitals. That was something that wasn't really spoken about in the election campaign. But nevertheless, in the Christian communities, that sort of word got out there and was doing the rounds on a grassroots level. And not only that, then you've got the safe schools, um, you know, uh, agenda and all of the other little, you know, the PC sort of approach and, and all of those sort of things, um, a treaty for the Aboriginal people. So these are all social issues that really made a big difference and made people turn. Why is it that the poor areas, the working class areas turned away from labour and the rich areas actually got a rise in the Labor vote because the rich areas are the ones that are concerned with these non-important non, um, non issues, climate change and all these, all these yuppie sort of uh, cafe latte kind of style bullshit. So, um, I mean, that's why they performed better in inner city areas and where there was a, an upper class population. At the same time, they lost their base. And they turned to the Liberal Party. I mean, even in Tasmania, Western Sydney, in Queensland. So this is what we're seeing here. I mean, the Liberal Party can talk, oh, it was had to do with economics. But really, they did say a lot of the time that this was going to be the climate change election. And it showed that they lost the climate change election. Well, the Greens and the Labor Party did anyway. Well, GoFundMe, it, it, before it was terminated, Israel Folau's page, it had raised $750,000 of the, the $3 million target, so it was already a quarter of the way there. That money was uh, refunded to donors, so the Australian uh, Christian Lobby, which is now under the leadership of Martin Isles, uh, they decided to host um, Israel Folau's uh, crowdfunding for his legal uh, fees uh, using uh, their website, which is hosted by Nation Builder, which is used by political organisations to to organise uh, during uh, election campaigns and for activism. And to my knowledge, a Nation Builder has never deplatformed a political organisation. I mean, they've uh, uh, hosted uh, people as diverse from Emmanuel Macron to, to Donald Trump, so they don't really... They're, they're just interested in being a platform. They, they, they don't really say, well, we're only going to support these uh, uh, types of causes. And pretty much all uh, political organizations pretty much use Nation Builder. I mean, Australian Conservatives use it, Liberal Democrats use it, uh, Australian Christian Lobby uh, use it. So uh, they uh, launched it uh, just on, on Tuesday morning. And at the time of this recording, it's already up to one2 uh, million just in a day, which is, well, that's pretty insane. It is. And it, it, like I said, it just reiterates the amount of support he has. I hope that everything um, works for him, at least on this platform here, um, just like it should. I mean, nobody should get turned away from a platform like this. Um, everybody should be free to use it. Um, if worse comes to worse, I mean, they could always end up uh, putting up bank details and getting people to do transfers if that, if that really is what, what needs to be done. Um, so there's plenty of ways to, to go about this, but it just really is um, disheartening when you do see platforms try to uh, restrict certain uh, people and, and groups away from the debate and, and to be able to promote their cause. So that, that's something that really um, is a real shame. Well, it's when this case does get to the Fair Work Commission, it's, it's going to, it's, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to, to contract law. It was because Rugby Australia, they, they better have done their homework and be 100% sure they were able to terminate his, his blame contract because if they lose, then they're going to be utterly humiliated. The, the sport of rugby union is, is going to look like a massive uh, joke. So this is well, forgetting all these cultural issues it's uh, the the actual case is is going to be a test of uh, 
sport, the sport itself, and also uh, this trend that we've seen of you know restrictive employment contracts, which because we do have social media these days, you can broadcast. You know, you're supposed to be representing your your company outside of of work hours, and you can bring your company into disrepute if you say something crude on the the internet. So there, there's certainly a lot riding on this case. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, they, they could even go broke after this, to be honest. And um, I think a lot of people, um, it, might, it might be a good karma to them, really, to to be able to go in there um, thinking they, they, they're, you know, going to tow um, a nice progressive sort of line to make people happy and then end up getting beaten at this. Um, I just don't understand how in contract law it's possible for a boss to actually own uh, somebody outside of the workplace. Um, I mean, that means that you're basically a full-time slave, you would think. I mean, isn't this something that the left wing would go nuts over? I mean, at least traditionally, that you are at home and you can't even say or do anything and your boss owns your yeah, they're, they're, The role <laughs> reversal is, is kind of been fascinating because we have, you know, uh, conservative liberals like Erica Betts, who was the employment minister under Tony Abbott, basically saying, you know, the, the Fair Work Commission, they, they need to protect the employee in Falau and also saying Australian Human mm. Rights Commission also needs to play a role in that. The, the mm. two organisations he was opposed to when he was a government minister and you have the left there saying, you know, we love these individual employment <laughs> contracts. So yeah. that's sort of been interesting, this sort of reversal. Well, it just shows that people actually, um, rather than stand by principle, they just sort of do whatever suits agendas. And that's no matter what side of politics, that's a, um, just what happens. It's a real shame. I mean, I'm actually speaking this from a principled point of view here. I wouldn't care what it is. I don't believe that any boss has a right to dictate what somebody can do out of the workplace. I mean, I think it's it's ridiculous. It's, you know, enslavement, I would say. I mean, you know, I understand having tough rules um, when you are got the jumper on and you're on the field and that you shouldn't be saying a certain thing. Oh, of course, I mean, that makes sense. But if you're at home and you're on your social media accounts and, you know, I mean, do you not have any privacy? Do you not have any uh, time where you're not, you know, you haven't got a big brother camera on you? Um, I don't care if you're a public figure or you're not. At the end of the day, surely these people have some rights here. I mean, they can't say anything or do anything just because somebody in Rugby Australia is offended. You know, it's just ridiculous. And would it happen the reversal if somebody on Rugby Australia um, was conservative and somebody was posting LGBT material? I mean, it would be an outcry. So it just doesn't make sense to me. I think it's best that we have principles that say that outside of work hours, people can do and say what they like. And I think at least um, there's less problems that way, really. I mean, uh, I just, I really can't, I just don't understand how a lot of people, at least, that I'm debating on the left, keep on bringing this issue up. He, he, he went against his TNCs, he went against his contract. Well, I don't give a shit. I mean, at the end of the day, it shouldn't be in his contract. This is a rule or, or um, you know, this is a kind of um, outlying factor here that this kind of, um, this kind of approach shouldn't be there. I mean, this guy should have some privacy. He should have some rights here that he's not you know, completely owned by his boss. Otherwise, you know, is he not just a slave to his workplace? I mean, surely even outside of work, he can do and say things without, you know, it disrupting or upsetting his boss. It, it just really is, is crazy, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> like I said, this is going to be a real test case for, for that uh, principle in general, regardless of what uh, your view is on what uh, Falau said. I mean, it was... Like, it was biblically correct, but it was a sort of uh, very grim message. And even Margaret Court said, well, perhaps it could have been a bit more uh, diplomatic. So there's so many yeah. issues at play here. It's just snowballed over, over this past week to represent so many different things. Yeah, and one thing, actually, I, I will say that I was impressed with, and I was kind of shocked. Um, there's a local guy um, in the Labor Party in my area called Stephen Jones, and he's actually somebody that is generally a very um, big pusher of LGBT issues. But this time, he actually, I heard him on the radio, he came out and said, 
look, um, I really disagree with um, Israel Folau's views, but I think that he has a right to say them. And I, I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. And I think he was actually, um, it helped that Israel Folau isn't white because he was using yeah, the issue of... Yeah, I heard that too. He, so. he, was, he was actually using the, the, the issue of multiculturalism and saying, well, look, when you have a multicultural society, you have um, a lot of different cultures with different beliefs, and that's why we have um, people that have Israel's uh, beliefs. So he's, he's at least gotten away with it since, you know, he isn't the white guy, um, and he's, you know, been able to have the race card there applied to him. But, um, you know, that's one thing, actually, if anything, that's good about uh, the, the, the overseas immigrants that we're getting at the moment. And I think something that's really going to um, piss off the left eventually is that the people that they're importing over here are actually ideologically very different and very opposing to their uh, progressive ideology, um, which is, you know, going to bite them in the ass. I think. I mean, I'm not saying that it's something that I really want because I'm not a fan of immigration, but it's definitely one of the few good things or aspects that you do get out of it. Well, to this uh, point, uh, for Laos uh, Islander ethnicity, it hasn't saved him from being uh, pilloried. Uh, I wrote a article, uh, this was a couple of months ago, uh, this is when the um, liberal Chinese candidate for Chisholm, Gladys uh, Lau, was getting into trouble for alleged homophobic comments that uh, she made, and uh, for Lau was just beginning to be in the headlines then, and I wrote that pretty uh, pretty much uh, these two cases show that, you know, uh, gays are higher on the uh, oppression hierarchy because, you know, it's coming from two non-white people and their, you know, racial uh, privilege hasn't hasn't saved them. But yeah, it was mm. uh, I think Stephen Jones, he's, he's one of the only uh, people to say that. Though I did see, uh, I think it was in one of the Fairfax papers where they said, oh, don't hold Israel Folau uh, responsible for his uh, views because it was white missionaries that um, imposed <laughs> Christianity on the poor uh, islander folks so they don't know any better. Yeah, so they're basically making him out to, to be um, um, someone that, you know, can't think for himself. And, you know, I mean, they, this is what the left do. I mean, they basically baby um, the minority groups and make them look, look to be stupid and, and, and that they can't think for themselves. They can't, you know, uh, it's just really remarkable how, how they put them down um, to such a level. Uh, in, a, in, a, in an effort, at least, they think that they're doing the right thing by um, victimising him or making him into victims, but they're actually really, you know, making him out to, to look really bad, to, to you know, be, be people that haven't got a brain and that can't, you know, operate and that are just, like you said, you know, they're just like that because other people told them to be, you know, I mean... It, it, it really is a shock, the way that they treat minorities. is um, It's just for their own benefit. And at the end of the day, they don't care about the minority groups. They're only using them as a divide and conquer strategy to be able to slowly um, erode whatever views or beliefs that are current in society. And they're just wanting to, um, in, you know, unleash their own sort of ideology. And they're using minority groups to be able to do that for their own reasoning. So... Um, where they can, they'll, they'll just do whatever they can with them. Now, the other big story of the past week has been uh, Cory Bernardi announcing that he would uh, deregister his Australian Conservatives political party that he founded in 2017 when he defected from the, the Liberal Party. Now, the party got this year 0.7% of the Senate vote and in the New South Wales state election, 0.6% of the Legislative Council vote. Basically, the party has been a complete failure, and Bernardi, in his uh, post on the, the, the website that he was going to deregister the party, said that his party is no longer needed because uh, Scott Morrison is a conservative Christian. Well, we've just spoken about how he's not. Sure. So basically, yeah. that rationale has gone out the window in a week. And he also said that oh, he was glad that he was a rational, uh, common sense person and that he you know, wasn't a, a radical or did outrageous things. And he was on uh, Paul Murray Live on Monday night uh, with Pauline Hansen, where she basically 
you know, sort of mocked him for being a failure. And like Corbin Odis was like, well, at least I have my dignity intact. At least I didn't uh, do conspiracy theories about, you know, Port Arthur basically being saying, <laughs> oh, I'm happy being a political loser. I mean, politics is about winning. Like, mm. you know, uh, like it's such a cop out to say, oh, well, you know, at least I stuck to my principles. Well, what good are your principles if like you don't get anywhere? I mean... Like, if you're just going to be, like, bland, vanilla conservatism, you're not you're not going to get anywhere. Like, going on Sky News, like, you know, every day, like, it's still watched mm -hmm. by just a small, like, section of the community. I mean, even though Paul Murray sort of might say, how you going, mate? You know, that's not going to translate into votes. And the only, uh, like, right-wing minor party that was successful in the election was... One Nation with Malcolm Roberts as the candidate who is an unapologetic climate skeptic, you know, takes takes the left on. You know, that's who, like, if you're going to vote for a minor party, you want it to be one that's, you know, bloody decent. Exactly. And we've got a, a, a lot of them to choose from, <laughs> which is unfortunate. But like, like I said, I mean, there's so many to choose from that if you're not one to stand out, then you're not going to get anywhere and you're going to fail. So he can come out all he wants and say, well, at least I uh, retain my principles. Well, your principles mean nothing, mate, because if they meant something, you'd be elected. You'd be, um, which, well, he currently is, but his team would be elected. He would get a lot more people in the Senate. He would actually perform well at elections. And he's not. Why? Because nobody is buying his ideology and his principles. I mean, I understand that his um, particular... Uh, I guess you could say ideology would have been very popular maybe 10 years ago. But this is 2019 now. I mean, a lot of things have happened since then. So if you're still sticking in the past and playing it safe, rather than going out there, um, being more radical, being more in your face, um, you know, that's what people want now. People are sick and tired of, you know, your vanilla conservative, your mainstream conservative, that doesn't buy votes anymore. It used to be popular during the Howard years, you know, I mean, it used to be big, but not anymore. I mean, since you had Trump, you had Brexit, you had all the European nationalist parties gaining ground, you had over here the Shooters Party, One Nation gaining ground. I mean, the whole, the whole system has changed. I mean, everything has changed in political landscape. And he's still playing the same game, still playing with the safe language, the sensible conservative. I mean, even their same-sex marriage slogan was crap. I mean, honestly, it's okay to say no. I mean, I mean, you know, that, that just describes, I mean, that is a typical Australian conservatives kind of line, even though it was used for that campaign, but it describes how these people just play it safe and think that that's going to earn them votes. People don't want that. I mean, we've got the left that are, are, are they're, they're animals, mate. You know, they're out there gluing themselves to bloody floors. <laughs> they're, they're out there, you know, screaming in people's faces. I mean, these people, you know, if you're sensible and you're all, you know, nice and decent, do you think you're going to get anywhere when you're dealing with these sort of people? You're not. You have to be not like them and, and, and not, like, not like them when it comes to... Um, how childish and immature and, and that, but you have to be still loud and in your face and radical, but in the right way. You can't play this, I'm going to be the sensible adult and I'm going to have my nice little principles and, and be just a tiny, slightly bit to the right of the Liberal Party and that's it. That doesn't get you anywhere. I mean, if people want the Liberals, they'll vote for the Liberals. And if they want something other than the Liberals, then they'll vote for One Nation, the Shooters Party, the CDP, or any other party on the right. There's plenty out there to choose from, and the Australian Conservatives didn't show that they were any different. There was nothing about them that stuck out and defined them. I mean, the best thing they had was when um, one of their candidates came out and said um, that they would like uh, chemical castration for uh, pedophiles. I mean, that, that was the best thing they had in the whole campaign. You know, when Ben Irwin was able to do that. So that just shows that they didn't really offer much to the public. And like I said, it might have worked 10 years ago. But now, when you've had culture wars, a lot of it changing, a lot of political correctness, a lot of uh, safe schools, everything being pushed on us, you can't just play 
the, the, the same old Liberal Party card or the same old Conservative card. You have to be more than that. And that's where people are looking for a party that will represent them. Why even people like Fraser Anning was to able to get uh, just as many votes as the Oscons because of that. He was out there, he was radical, and people respected him for it because he had principles. And he was willing to take on the establishment, whereas the Oscons were representing the establishment. Maybe not so uh, bad as, say, the Greens or the Labor Party, but still they were providing change. And that's where we need it. Now, a lot of his members and supporters, like they weren't told in advance that this announcement was coming. And there was already a lot of unhappiness with the party structure because it was basically all the power was centralized in the, the leadership. And a couple of weeks beforehand, there was an email went out to strong conservative supporters saying we've, we're moving offices. We've got 50%. Uh, off our uh, party merchandise and then two weeks later the the party is being uh, deregistered and so that sort of sale is <laughs> well you know what are you going to do with the merchandise now yeah i mean we we actually predicted this um a fair while ago that the australian conservatives weren't going to last <laughs> and um basically we discussed it just then um it was in reference of them not being able to stand out and identify themselves as something other than the two-party system i mean they really were the same old and they didn't break away from that um and they were just too vanilla for um for the society that is starting to shoot uh, shoot out more the the nationalist kind of um structure um especially on the right that's where it's heading now i mean when you're looking at um all the right-wing ideologies, nationalism really is the one that has got the focus and that is doing well and performing. Um, you're not getting much in the liberal or the conservative cause or even the libertarian cause. They're going really downwards and nationalism. Um, so that didn't surprise me that they went downhill. And when it came to, um, I mean, Corey, we always thought was going to go back to the liberals regardless, and we thought it was going to be a failed venture. Um, and the merchandise, it, you know, it, it's funny, but it wasn't going to last, you know. I mean, even people in the party should have really seen it coming for what it was. I mean, um, I, I just one thing that really makes me laugh is that uh, some candidates of the Oscons have come out and said, well, you know what, we're going to rebrand ourselves into another party name and basically do the exact same thing as we were doing before. So the thing is, it's not the name. If you're even if Corey was running the party as a dictatorship, which he was, it's not still going to change anything. If you're holding on to the same principles that were rejected because they weren't radical and they were too vanilla, then people aren't going to all of a sudden turn to you guys if you just change the name and nothing else. You have to change your policy direction. Yes, well, the the New South Wales branch of Australian Conservatives, they have said that they're going to rebrand and uh, their Senate candidates at the election, Sophie York and Ricardo Bossi, who was on this show uh, a few weeks back, they're uh, staying put. And Ricardo, he is definitely more radical and wants to be mm. bolder than you know, Australian Conservatives were uh, under Bernardi. He's under no illusion that things have to change they want to make the party uh more more democratic and yeah well we we just spoke about how you know scott morrison he he's not going to be a a culture warrior on the issue of importance to uh conservatives and uh there, there is a radical change undergoing in uh the other major conservative party in new south wales the the christian democrats with uh Samuel Joshua Gruel, who's uh, been on uh, an unshackled uh, live stream. Uh, he uh, stood as a Christian Democrat candidate at the state election. He uh, was able to put forward a motion uh, three weeks ago to remove the, the, the state executive at uh, state council. He was assisted uh, by another young member, uh, Joel Jamal. Uh, they're wanting to implement generational change in the in the Christian Democrats, and it's, they've managed to. These two young guns have been able to topple uh, Fred Niles uh, people in the party, which is a pretty uh, astounding achievement for, for for people their age. So, at least in New South Wales, at, at least uh, there is they they real because 
neither Australian Conservatives or Christian Democrats at the state election won uh, a seat. So something needs to change. There needs to be a differentiation. There needs to be a more bold, you know, you need to make, make a more, I wouldn't say principled stand, but you need to make a a louder stand, a, a more braver stand on on these issues and, and not be afraid that, you know, you're not going to get invited on Sky News because, you know, you said something mean or inappropriate. Yeah, that's right. That's what they need to do. I mean, the thing that has plagued both the CDP and the Australian Conservatives is that, um, I guess to put it uh, nicely, that it has been plagued with a lot of cuckservatives um, within those two parties, and that's why change is needed, especially that's why the CDP is undergoing this shift, because those members um, are trying to change that image and provide it with a little bit more of a radical approach, which will get it more um, more votes and, and more of a, a standpoint, especially when they're seeing how well uh, One Nation and the Shooters Party, for instance, are doing in New South Wales when compared to themselves. So I think that's something that really ultimately needs to happen. And the Australian Conservatives, hopefully they follow down the same path. Now, um, I think that uh, what the CDP did was a really wise decision. I think the only thing that I could do um, in criticism of that was that I, if I was in Samrat's shoes, wouldn't have gone out to the public and announced it and, and um, made it a really uh, out there big deal about it because what I would have done is anything internally that has occurred, I would have kept it behind closed doors and basically if I had taken over the party, um, whoever normally votes for the CDP wouldn't have known any better and would have continued to vote for the CDP plus the people that then got on board with this change would have also voted for you and you would have gotten a, a bigger portion of the vote. But because you've gone out there and announced that a lot of people that, for instance, are Fred Nile loyalists uh, might get um, offended by what's happened and turn away from the party. So even though you gain some people, you also lose some people. And likewise, sometimes pride can get to you if you are um, going out there and seen to be someone that is... Um, uh, showing off what you've tried to achieve. So I think he's done the right thing, but I think it would have been better for him to keep it hush-hush, at least for now. Um, but nevertheless, those two parties need that change. And I think, um, you know, if they were to remain very uh, loyal in the Christian principles, but at the same time also be more nationalistic, um, a little bit more radical, I think they would do very well electorally. Um, people, for instance, that normally would be enticed to vote for One Nation but also um, have Christian values as well would definitely park their vote there. Um, at the moment, some people wouldn't because they feel that they're just too vanilla and that's where they have to then try and get that uh, that middle, middle of the road sort of and, and cater for, for those those people that are, are feeling forgotten. Um, I actually, funny enough, uh, an Australian Conservatives person might have provided a little bit of hints when it came to the uh, to the name change because they came out with a new uh, new email address and it said at the free at freedom party you know hotmail .com or whatever it was. So I'm not sure if that's a hint as to um, what their new name might be, but. I just noticed that someone that used to be in the Auscons that were advertising that there was radical changes happening and new labels and so forth had uh, put out an email address that uh, was classified as the Freedom Party. So that could be a hint, but I can't confirm because I'm ultimately not 100% sure. Well, the, the next federal election is not until 2022. The next New South Wales state election is not until 2023. So they've got time. Uh, these organizations they should take the time to you know put in a proper long-term strategy about how they're going to recruit how they're going to fundraise uh, deploy volunteers you know make them energized and of course most important thing make sure that you can get votes i mean mm. i mean if israel falau can like his legal fund can have a million dollars in in one day like it can be done exactly right and why not even have Falau uh, lead the charge and put him as the Senate candidate? <laughs> yeah, that'd be pretty. Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, 
that would be a, a huge thing for them to be able to score some uh, high-profile candidate like that, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, it worked pretty well for uh, for One Nation with Mark Latham in New South Wales. Mm. Yeah, 100%. And, I mean, One Nation performed this exceptionally well, I mean, really, in that in that election. And, um, and you have to keep in mind that they didn't even run in every seat. Um, and if they did, then they could have maybe even gotten three senators in. I mean... Um, they only ran in about a dozen seats out of, uh, I think there's about 50 seats in New South Wales or so, something like that. So when you look at it like that, I mean, their vote was massive. Um, so really, they're the party, it seems, that uh, people can say have the greatest chance on the right at the moment, um, at least when it comes to um, a general, general level. And... For people that are focused in regional areas, then I would say the shooters are, are doing really well in the in the regional areas. Um, so really, those two parties there can um, start to bite into the national party vote and, and slowly get there. Because if they've got the right values out there, people are starting to get on board, and that, that's what it takes, you know. And um, we'll see uh, what what ends up happening with. Uh, the, the remainder of the Australian Conservatives that want to uh, start something new and also the CDP. And hopefully um, in no time at all, we'll actually have a bit of an understanding as to who is where and what is what. Because at the moment, all we're doing is basically uh, um, guessing really and you know putting a bit of a hypothesis out there as to what it could be. But we're not really sure. So having a bit of clarity might be good. Now, Damien, on Saturday, you were at the, the True Blue Crew uh, New South Wales Aussie Pride Solidarity March that was in Pen Penrith, which is in the far west of Sydney. Now, there was only about 30 people there, so, you know, very small turnout. There were no local Antifa there, but I heard that they were operating a drone uh, in the area, so they were, you know, still keeping a, an eye on you. Now... I think that the main reason why uh, there, there was such a, a low turnout, there wasn't even a, a flag march in, in Melbourne this year. This is uh, where uh, uh, these uh, rallies uh, began, is because True Blue Crew has been banned from Facebook, along with well, United Patriots Front, Lad Society, uh, Cook's Convicts. I mean, the only uh, page which I saw the rally uh, being promoted was uh, Reg Penny's uh, New South Wales Patriots Against the Extreme Left. Uh, that was the the only page. And, you know, like deplatforming, it does work. I mean, Facebook has been able to effectively kill a lot of nationalist activism in Australia. Oh, yes, definitely. I mean, that is definitely what you get when it comes to deplatforming. I mean... But when you really look at it, 30 people, 30 people or so isn't a bad turnout considering that it wasn't even publicised, really. Apart from, like you said, I think it was the day before or two days before the event that um, Reg put up his post on that page of um, um, against the extremist left. So really, not many people knew about it. Um, so considering that it wasn't able to be publicised because everyone was shut down... It wasn't a bad turnout. I mean, I know last year uh, we ended up getting, oh, it could have been close to 100. It could have been about 70, 80 people, so forth. So it was a, definitely a better turnout. But the reasons why were that it was promoted a lot more on Facebook because the group hadn't been banned then. Also, it was located in the CBD, so a lot of more people would have been able to access that location rather than having to travel um, a fair distance out of um, the CBD to the far west. And also it was held on a Sunday, whereas this time it was held on a Saturday, so a lot of people also work on a Saturday. Um, so there was a lot of factors in play there as to why not as many people turned out as we had thought would come. Um, but when you look at it, at the reasons why, then you can see why that might be the case. Um, but one good thing about ha having it down that, that area was that there was no Antifa. There's no way that you would get protesters travelling five, co five kilometres all over um, outside of a CBD regardless. Um, but it was a, a safe area. 
it's actually one of the last um, white havens, so to speak, or whatever left in Sydney. Um, so that's something that um, um, that uh, Ricky Turner actually uh, had said during my interview with him. And it, it was just a, a really good receptive area. I mean, even when we were walking down the street, a lot of people on the side, uh, you know, were, seemed really supportive of it. There was no one coming out and saying anything. Like, I know that if we were in the city, you'd have people yelling out from the background. It would be a totally different environment, totally in a different zone, different area. So for that reason, it was good to have it there, but it did work against them for those reasons I highlighted. Yeah, Ricky Turner, he was the, the special guest uh, for the mm. uh, the rally. He'd come up from, from Melbourne. And that's probably the other thing, because Melbourne has sort of been the, the epicenter of patriot activism just because it's where the left are, are most feral and so there's more pushback against them. Sydney, mm. he used to have a big personality in Nick Folks, but he's taken, a, uh, from the Party for Freedom, he's taken a back seat mm. uh, for, the, for the past... A uh, couple of years, so there hasn't been sort of a really big, controversial personality up there in Sydney. I mean, Mitch Van Dam, he's you know he's done a good job, uh, you know, running the the TVC up there, but he's sort of he, he's 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 not a very sort of extroverted personality. Yeah, that's true. I mean, he is a very quiet person. Um, he is someone that um, allows other people to take. Uh, control and to be the main speakers and to really drive the agenda and he's sort of in the background does all the, the sort of uh, backdoor stuff but nevertheless not everybody has it in him um, he still does his own uh, hard work in the in the in the forefront to promote his group and all that uh, not everybody has that sort of um, that that way about him where they could just go out and you know have that very that charisma you know not everybody's got it but he has the other factors in place um, where he can really push this group in, in the background. And that's where, how, how he does it. He'll get a, a popular personality, someone like, for instance, you know, last time he had Dan Evans. He has people like this that are really the, the, the speakers. And then he'll do his stuff in the background and have a word or whatever at the end of the event, uh, thanking all the people to come out and, and so forth. And there's nothing wrong with that, of course. Now, um, he doesn't do a lot of events. Um, unlike when Nick Folks was doing events, it was quite regular. You were getting events, um, you know, sometimes on a monthly basis or um, every couple of months there was something on, so it was quite regular. In 2016 and 17, there was a lot of events I went to of his, um, and now he's on hiatus for um, a year and a half or so he's been, so he's slowly started to uh, calm down and there's nothing really much happening there. But like you also mentioned, it's more popular in Melbourne because the left is much more in control, much more um, people are oppressed there. Whereas in Sydney, um, I'd say New South Wales, like Queensland, is a lot more of a conservative kind of state. Um, and that's why it's maybe not as big of a scene here that it, like it is in Victoria. But it was still good to have such an event take place regardless. And I was actually, I didn't even know Ricky Turner was going to be there. And it was quite a surprise to see him there because he traveled a long distance for this event. And I actually spoke to him later and he said, well, um, I told him, uh, are you are you staying here overnight? And he says, no, nah, I've got a plane in a, a couple of hours and he's going back home. So, <laughs> um, you know, I got to hand it to him for making that journey just to come to that event. It was great. I definitely think that uh, well, the the Patriot movement they should have had a plan B like because they were just so used to using Facebook and they were so effective mm. at it. I mean, the United Patriots front Facebook page before it uh, got deleted it had 120 thousand likes, and you know you just had to see the Bendigo rallies back in 2015. It was insane the uh, the level of support on the ground and. Like they need to like you know take the steps that you know we described that like sort of the, the Christian lobby has had like use the the nation builder software. I mean they haven't deplatformed anybody yet. You know grow an email list. Like look for other ways to you know promote yourself where you know there's less of a chance you're going to be deplatformed because you know the big tech and you know social media giants. You know you can't can't rely on them. Like they pulled pulled the plug on them and. And that's it. There sort of needs to be sort of more, more online infrastructure. 
Exactly. There needs to be um, other social media that is used, for instance, even uh, more sites that are um, more kinder to our side of politics. And also people even going to an old traditional format of um, accessing actual websites, creating websites and even having forums where people can sign in as a member and having people on there. There's no way of deplatforming if you are actually running a forum on your own website. And that's something that used to be very popular in the day and I recommend people do that again because it used to work. Uh, before even social media you know, was really um, at the forefront of communication, that's something that people used as a means. And um, it really did work back then. On the actual event in itself, it was still a great day. There was many speakers. You had a speaker from the Lad Society. You had um, multiple speakers uh, address the issues of concern. And I think uh, one thing really was that I, I found amusing was actually uh, just knowing how the mainstream media would portray this and then watching the highlights afterwards and having it confirm what my suspicions were going to be. Um, when, when I was there and I was listening to the speeches, there was actually one uh, Seven News personnel, his name was uh, Brian Seymour, and he was um, filming a lot, a lot of it on the march and also parts of the speeches. And I actually uh, noticed that when people were speaking, he was on the side, um, you know, obviously listening in, and he was actually smirking and rolling the eyes when people were saying things. And I thought to myself, you, you know, you've got to be kidding, right? Just the attitude that this guy displayed, um, it was remarkable. <laughs> and um, when I saw the footage that Seven News put out, uh, of course you had far-right extremist rally, um, epic failure, only 30 people, you know, like they made it out to be such a, a, a bad event. And also, um, they even labelled it a funeral procession and really bizarre. I mean, the, the, the language they used, the language they used was just insane, you know. I mean, insane, not even subliminal bias, but right out there biased. I mean, really, you know, shitting all over the event. And at the end of the day, one good thing I, that did come out of it was most of the comments on there were actually supportive. You did have your trolls. But a lot of people were saying, hold on a second, why is it such a big deal or a bad thing that people are walking down the street with the Australian flag? What's going on here? You know, I mean, people don't understand why this is being criticised as, as an extremist event. Uh, there was nothing of extremism there. And for anybody to classify the TBC as uh, extremist, I think, is, is insane, really. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think... We're just watching the footage or whatever was a good laugh. Um, that, that's for sure. And just, you know, the, the amount of cops they had. You know, they had like 50 cops or so out there. And you're thinking, why do they need so many people here? I mean, why is the taxpayer paying um, for all these police to be here? There's, there's no need for it. And someone that actually spoke said it quite rightly that they're not here for our protection. They believed that they're using it as a standover tactic. It's very interesting how they, um, you know, labelled it as such. I thought it was, um, you know, something that really highlighted what was going on on the event. It's, you know, it was remarkable, really. Yeah, I saw the Daily Telegraph uh, headline that, you know, fears about uh, extreme right-wing event. You know, this is the words that they use, you know, far right, extreme, you know, far right, you know, really, you know, they, they like to make, you know, the patriot movement, you know, to be big and scary. And it's like, you mustn't, you know, be like anywhere near anything that they're going to do. But like you said, like nationalism it's it's popular and yet the mainstream media shit all over it that's right that's right i mean and just the way they do it too they really demean it they really put it down like these people are scum you know i mean that's what ricky t actually said when he was speaking they make us out to look like scum and they really do. I mean, just their attitude. I mean, we actually spoke to, or I heard a few people speak to some of the media personnel and, you know, they were just having a conversation and saying, one guy actually said to one of the, um, the people, and I believe that they may have been from the AAP, and he said, I really detest the words far-right extremists. We're not extremists at all. 
and I hate how you guys in the media use that term. It's, it's a disgusting term to use when it doesn't describe what we are, um, but they continue to use it, you know. And one other thing that I highlight, and this was something that I actually argued on um, when it came on the 7 News video and in the comments section, I said, why is it that when the left wing hold a rally and you have, you know, people really doing extreme things like gluing themselves to the roads, why doesn't it say that they're left wing extremists? It doesn't say that. It says, you know, peaceful activists. It says, mm. um, you know, all these positive sort of, you know, words like, you know, um, protesters, you know, that they're, they're rebelling against, you know, the system, even though they're basically, you know, doing the system's bidding because everyone, every, everything that they stand for, you know, uh, the corporates and everyone else up top, the elites, they're, they're pushing this agenda, and these people think they're actually rebelling, yet they're actually echoing what they are, are told to echo. But that's the funny thing about it. I mean, if you really want to look at who's the anti-establishment, it's got to be the people that are deemed far-right extremists because they're the ones that are getting targeted and branded and put down and attacked and shut down, deplatformed. You're not getting people supporting climate change and supporting LGBT rights getting deplatformed. So what does that tell you? I mean, who's the one that's anti-establishment here? Um, so this is this is a thing. You're never going to get far left extremists, you know. Um, it's just it's a sad thing. But it was in the end of the day, it was a great rally. It was a great um, great to meet people, uh, good speeches, uh, a, a great procession over from park to park, and it was just a good day out to meet new people. And at the end of the day, it could have been a bigger turnout, but. Considering what I mentioned earlier, it was what it was. I mean, there was factors in place that prevented that turnout being larger. And even though because of the location of the day and all of that, and the huge factor, the deplatforming, that really harmed the event because it wasn't able to get out there to many people on Facebook. And unfortunately, many people haven't moved on to other social media sites. So they're only on Facebook, and if they're banned off Facebook, these, these groups, how else are they going to get the word out there? Unless, like you said, they get a database of people, an email list, so forth, and they actually are able to send information out. And this is something where I think these groups have to really start thinking here, that since Facebook is no longer a reality, they have to find other ways to get out there, to get their events pushed. So then they can have good turnouts because when you have a good turnout, that makes the media watch and say, wow, these guys have support. Whereas if you only have a small turnout, they laugh at you. I mean, this is the reality. It's unfair, but that is what it is. And people can see uh, your footage uh, from the, the rally. There's a, a highlights uh, video as well as an interview with Ricky T on the Unshackled's YouTube channel. So I recommend that uh, all of our uh, viewers and followers check that out if you want to see what uh, mm. really happened uh, last Saturday. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely good to see for people out there that are interested. And one thing I will add, actually, that I forgot... Um, one thing that was interesting was when I was interviewing Ricky T, we actually got in at a pub, at the front of a pub, and he was standing at, at the front of a Australian flag he had in the background. And we actually had a girl that worked in the pub that we ate at come out and basically say to us, oh, you know, I'm just coming to make sure that you guys haven't got our logo in the background to, you know. So they were basically trying to disassociate uh. or our... They were, they were trying to make sure that they were disassociated from somebody talking to a camera that had the Australian flag in the background. And we said to them, look, we're not saying anything about you guys. Your logo's not in the background. It's just a flag that's in. And they said, fine. And they walked off. But this is the thing. I mean, when the Australian flag becomes an extremist symbol, how can it be an extremist symbol? I mean, in America, it's idolized. It's such a, a great thing. I mean, if you're... If you go against the, the flag, you're treasonous. You're a traitor. But here it seems people, you know, to, it's popular to shit on the flag. And for anybody that stands up for it and, and wears the, the colours in pride is an extremist. It's quite different to how it is in the States, unfortunately. Yeah, well, that's definitely right. 
Well, it's been good to to catch up on the the issues of the week and also hear your on the ground uh, report uh, from the the rally in in Penrith. And uh, we'll be back at this uh, regular time slot of uh, Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern time uh, for our viewers so they can regularly tune in. Uh, thanks for having me, Tim. And I just hope that everybody tunes into our footage of the uh, live event that we ended up doing over the weekend and that they continue to tune into our podcast on a weekly basis. And that's the show for today. As you know, a regular topic of discussion on these shows is big tech deplatforming. We are certainly aware this could happen to us at any moment, which is why we have our website and email list, and as well as having a presence on mainstream social media. We also are on free speech social media, where we have a growing following. We are on gab.ai slash the unshackled. We are also on minds.com slash the underscore unshackled. We are also at mewe.com slash p slash the unshackled. We also have our growing Telegram channel on the popular encrypted messaging service at t.me slash the unshackled. Remember that we rely on your financial support, uh, you followers at The Unshackled, to continue to produce the content that we do. The options are you can pledge over at patreon.com slash the unshackled or directly via our paypal.me slash the unshackled. We also have our premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash membership or our donation form at theunshackled.net slash donate. And we also are opening up on Subscribestar, where you can go to subscribestar.com slash theunshackled. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.